Hey guys, it's your first video lecture of the semester. I know you've been excited about it, so let's go ahead and jump right in. Please make sure you are filling in your notes organizer as I go through the PowerPoint. Today's topic is going to be the principles of ecology. This is a topic very familiar to you, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about some of these things. If you need extra help, feel free to pause, replay, or restart at any time. So if we're going to talk about ecology, we need to talk about what ecology is. Ecology is the study of the interactions between organisms, so organisms with other organisms, but also between organisms and their environment. These terms you'll hear me use a lot, you probably already know what they mean. Biotic factors versus abiotic factors. Biotic factors are the living factors in an ecosystem, bio means life. The abiotic factors are going to be the non-living factors. So biotic factors, normally we think of plants and animals, but don't forget about bacteria, protists, fungi. And then for the abiotic factors, those are going to be things like water, sunlight, temperature, rocks, and soil. Okay, so looking at this lovely picture of a tropical rainforest on your notes organizer, see if you can identify three examples of biotic factors and three examples of abiotic factors. Okay, um, the biosphere is about several kilometers above the Earth's surface and about several kilometers below the ocean surface. So basically, the biosphere is the place on Earth where you have life. So the biosphere is made up of smaller ecological levels. So going from smallest to largest, that would be the single organism, and then a population, and then a community, and then an ecosystem, and then a biome, and then all the biomes together make up the biosphere. So we're going to talk about what each one of these um, is and also examples of what's included. Please fill in your chart as we go through it. So one single living thing is called an organism. So our example, we're going to go with the desert ecosystem here, is going to be one individual rattlesnake. A population consists of organisms made up of the same species. So if our single organism was a rattlesnake, our population would be a group of rattlesnakes. A biological community is all of the interacting populations within that same area. So remember, our population was a group of rattlesnakes. So all of the populations would be the rattlesnakes, the lizards, the coyotes, the fungi, the cacti, the grasses, all of the biotic factors that make up the Sonoran Desert. So community is all the biotic factors. So going even bigger than community, you have the biotic factors plus the abiotic factors. That would be your ecosystem. So we have our community, rattlesnakes, lizards, coyotes, fungi, cacti, grasses. But now also in an ecosystem, we're going to have sunlight, sand, rocks, and then of course the temperature of the Sonoran. All the biotic and the abiotic make up the ecosystem. And then we have all the similar uh, ecosystems in the North American, you know, the west portion of, of North America that are going to make up the desert biome. So a biome is a large group of ecosystems with similar climates, plants, and animals. And then of course all the biomes together, that's everywhere there is life, so that makes up the biosphere. And there's a picture showing you that we're going from smallest to largest. Okay, I am not going to spend a lot of time talking about the different biomes. If you need extra help with that, I am posting some PowerPoints to the blog. Feel free to look through those or any of the uh, tutorial links that we used in class the other day. But you do need to know what is used to classify a biome. What makes a biome a biome? It's having similar of these four categories, precipitation, temperature, plants, and animals. Sometimes you'll hear it as three major categories, and that's because precipitation and temperature make up the climate. So sometimes you'll hear climate, plants, and animals. Okay, so those there are your major terrestrial biomes or land biomes. Here are your major aquatic biomes. Here's this lovely little pie graph showing you that you know, of all the water that we have on Earth, 98% of it is salt water, only 2% of it is fresh water. And then of that tiny little 2%, most of that is glaciers and most of that is groundwater. Very small, small amount are going to be lakes and rivers. Feel free to pause on this chart if you need to uh, get any of this extra information. You can use this to help you fill in the chart that we did in class the other day. You've probably seen all this information before in seventh grade. I do want to make sure you know how to read each of these three graphs. Um, so this top left graph here, and these are questions on your notes organizer. What biome would you expect to find at 150 centimeters of, of rain and 10 degrees Celsius of annual temperature? So use that graph to see if you can figure out what biome you would be in. 
you'd be in the temperate deciduous forest, right smack dab in the middle. Okay, use this graph to, to answer the question, uh, which biome would you expect to find closer to the equator, the temperate deciduous forest or the coniferous forest, which is what they're calling the needle leaf forest. Okay, so here is the equator. Here's increasing lati latitude, or it could be decreasing latitude, just further away from the equator. But you're going to have temperate deciduous forest before you have coniferous forest. So you would expect to find the temperate deciduous forest closer to the equator. Okay, and then finally, looking at that climatogram, remember the bar graph is showing the precipitation for each month. The line graph is showing the temperature. So on your paper, what, what biome would you expect that climatogram to be from? Lots of rainfall every month. Pretty steady temperature, but it's pretty warm. So that would be the tropical rainforest. Okay, there's some freshwater biome, the different zones of the lakes and ponds. Here are the different zones of our marine ecosystems. Now, obviously, the most biodiverse zones, whether freshwater or marine, are going to be the zones that are shallow. And the reason for that is because there's sunlight there. So the more sunlight, the more producers you can have, the more producers you can have, the more consumers you can support. Okay, a couple of vocab terms before we move on. You probably already have heard these words before. A habitat is just simply where an organism lives. A niche is the role that an organism has in its environment. So our bumblebee here, while we may not love them, they do have a niche in the environment that they live in. They are pollinators. So that would be a role that it plays in its environment. Okay, so we have communities. Remember, those are all the interacting populations, all the biotic factors, and those are controlled by what's called limiting factors. So anything that can restrict or control the size of a population is called a limiting factors. A limiting factor. So you can have water be a limiting factor, sunlight, food, shelter, space, predators, prey, all of those things can control the size of a population. And then once you reach what's called the carrying capacity, you've reached the maximum number of a, of, of a population that an ecosystem can support. So looking at our graph here, what do you think the carrying capacity of deer would be for this habitat or this ecosystem? It's probably somewhere around 80 deer because once you get past 80, you can see the population begins to decrease and then it sort of floats around right at that 80 uh, deer mark because then the limiting factors have kicked in, they've sort of restricted the size of the population and you have reached your carrying capacity. Some limiting factors depend on the size of a population and other limiting factors don't. So the factors, the limiting factors that don't depend on the size of a population are going to be density independent factors. This would be something like the weather. The weather doesn't, it doesn't matter what the size of a population is to affect the weather, right? Or fires or air pollution or anything like that. Air pollution can control the size of a population, but it doesn't depend on the size of a population. Density dependent factors, however, do depend on the size of a population. So this would be something like disease. Disease is going to have a different impact on a population depending on the size of the population. Same with competition, same with predators, same with parasites. So where do these biological communities come from? Well, they, they come from a, a process called ecological su succession. This is a process where you replace one biological community with another, and this is a result of the changing factors, both biotic and abiotic in an ecosystem. There are two types of ecological succession, primary succession and secondary succession. Primary succession takes place when you have newly exposed rock, which does not have a topsoil. So how do we end up with newly exposed rock that doesn't have a topsoil? Well, that usually happens after a volcanic eruption or when you have the melting of a glacier or the retreating of a glacier. And then you have new rock. So there are only certain things that can live on that newly exposed rock, and those are called pioneer species. Things like lichens, mosses, liverworts. They don't have roots. They don't need a lot of nutrients. They can live and grow on that newly exposed rock. And then they help to break the rock down, form a tiny little topsoil la layer. Now you can have these small plants start to grow. They'll make a bigger topsoil layer. Then you can have the grasses and then eventually the shrubs until you've got this nice thick topsoil where you can support these nice big mature trees. And then you can support a greater diversity of, of animals as well. 
Secondary succession takes place when you have a newly cleared area, but the topsoil layer remains. So you can sort of skip that pioneer species um, section of succession. So this usually takes place after something like a forest fire or a flood or a hurricane or a tornado. The area is cleared out, but the topsoil remains. So you just basically start off with small little plants that start to grow. They get bigger, then you can support grasses, then you can support, sh support shrubs, then you have your smaller trees until eventually you can have your larger trees. Here's a couple of other vocab terms for you that you're already probably familiar with. Competition. Competition does not mean fight. I do not want to hear you say fight when we talk about competition. Competition simply means one or more organisms trying to use the same resource. So competition can take place between plants. Plants in the tropical rainforest compete for sunlight. They're not fighting each other. You don't see a tree punching another tree. So I don't want you to use that term. It just means that organisms are trying to use the same resources, the same limiting factors. And then you have predation, which is where one organism hunts and kills another. The hunter is the predator, of course. The hunted is the prey. So in the case of our bird and our worm here, the predator would be the bird. The prey would be the worm. Okay, do you remember talking about symbiosis in seventh grade? Symbiosis is a long-term close relationship that exists between two or more different species living in an area. There are three types of symbiotic relationships. You have mutualism, commensalism, and parasitism. On your little chart there, under symbols, I want you to draw these little happy faces and sad faces and straight faces. Mutualism is when you have two happy faces. Oops, sorry. Commensalism is where, when you have one happy face and one straight face. Parasitism is when you have one happy face and one sad face. And you can tell from these symbols probably what these three different relationships mean. So mutualism, two happy faces, is when both species are benefiting from the relationship. This would be like the oxpeckers, those little birds that eat, eat pests off of zebras. So the zebras are getting these parasites taken off of them. That's good for them. And then the oxpeckers are getting food. So they're benefiting from the relationship as well. So the feeling is mutual. They're both very happy. That is a mutualistic symbiotic relationship. Commensalism, a happy face and a straight face. This is where one species benefits and the other doesn't benefit from the relationship, but it's also not hurt from the relationship. So that's our straight face. So this would be an example of a bird um, laying in, putting a nest and laying eggs in a tree. The bird is benefiting because they're getting a nice protected space for their you know, offspring to grow and develop. While the tree, I mean, the tree doesn't care whether the bird's nest is there or not. It doesn't take nutrients away from them or anything like that. So that would be an example of commensalism, happy face, straight face. Then you have parasitism, happy face, sad face. This is where one species benefits from the relationship while the other is harmed. An example would be like a tick living on a dog. The tick is getting food, that would be blood. So that would be the parasite, that's the one benefiting from the relationship. And then the dog would be the host, the one being harmed. It's having blood taken away from him, obviously that's not good. Um, it can, diseases can be spread through the tick, so that would be an example of a parasitic symbiotic relationship. Okay, a couple more words you're probably familiar with, autotrophs versus heterotrophs. Um, an autotroph is another name for a producer, and we talked about this with photosynthesis. These are organisms which use energy from the sun or other substances in order to produce food on their own, food for the organism. So this is like photosynthesis or chemosynthesis, which we'll talk about, but basically they make their own food. They don't have to consume anything else. A heterotroph is also known as a consumer. That's what we are. They have to obtain energy by consuming other organisms. And there are different types of heterotrophs. You've heard this before. Herbivores eat plants, carnivores eat animals, omnivores, this is what we are. We eat both plants and animal, animals. Um, you have things like detrivores and scavengers that eat the remains or decaying portion of plants and animals. Then you, heat, you have um, decomposers, which are slightly different because they break down the decaying matter externally and then absorb the nutrients internally, whereas scavengers do everything internally. So I'm going to stop here for today. Um, you can leave the, re the rest blank for now. We're going to do the rest in class. I hope you're having a great day. Bye.